the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So a rabbi tells this story. Two brothers have a, a milling operation, a millery, and uh, uh, part of what they do with what they don't sell is they split it equally. Uh, they both go and put it in their respective granaries for their families and for um, uh, a rainy day, so to speak. Uh, and over the course of time, uh, they continue to accumulate quite a bit of grain. And one day, one of the brothers is sitting around the dinner table with his family and enjoying his wife and, and children and thinks to himself, you know, it's not right. My brother lives all alone and has no one to take care of him if something were to happen should get more grain than me. But he knew his brother was proud and would never accept the, uh, the gift of grain. So what he would do is he'd take a wheelbarrow out, lay it into the night after he knew his brother was asleep. And he would take some grain and put it into uh, his brother's silo, into his brother's granary. Uh, unbeknownst to him, the other brother thought to himself one day and said, you know what? It's just me. I live by myself. I'm pretty easy to take care of. My brother has a wife and two children that need, uh, that need care. He should get a larger share of the granary. And so he would uh, wait till he was sure that his brother and their family was sound asleep. Uh, and he would take his wheelbarrow and he'd fill it with grain and he'd go into uh, his brother's granary and, and, and put the grain in. And both were somewhat perplexed by the fact that the quantities of grain didn't seem to uh, uh, change very much within their respective granaries. Um, but they paid that no attention. They just figured abundance is abundance. Um, until one day, wait, uh, actually it wasn't a day, it was late at night. Uh, while both were supposed to be sound asleep, um, they ran across each other in the middle of the night, uh, both with wheelbarrows full of grain. Um, and in that specific spot where they met, uh, they embraced, uh, laughed, and hugged, and expressed their love and gratitude for one another. Uh, and the rabbi said, that place, that place where the two brothers met, that is where the Lord's house should be. The Lord's house should be built on a place of great and profound joy. That's where it should be. Worship, the house of the Lord, should be a place where when you come, you get so excited that you lose your voice. <laughs> Now, I know we come in here with a lot of expectations, uh, but usually we leave with our voice intact, and we come during lots of seasons that fill us in lots of different ways. Uh, and oh, I, prayer, uh, less than that you leave here, of course, uh, might be that you leave here thinking, it was good that I was at church today. Uh, my week, uh, my direction in life, uh, my sense of self uh, has, been, has been lifted, uh, and my uh, course has been turned a little bit uh, by my experience should be a place of joy. Maybe not the, uh, the screaming into the television screen joy, uh, but that rich, deep, abiding joy. That's what this should be, and that's what our faith should be about. Hold on to that. This, this, is, gonna, this is a pretty complicated sermon, so there's lots of this. So hold on. Put that in box A. Uh, realize I'm going on a few hours of sleep, too. So uh, Now let's go to the first lesson. The covenant between God and Abraham uh, one-sided covenant. God said, your ancestors will outnumber the stars. Um, and uh, you know, the, I did ask uh, him to sacrifice his son, but you know, once you get past that part of the story, uh, really it was a fairly unconditional uh, covenant. God had all of the responsibility. Uh, but the people who fled uh, from Egypt, who were freed from Egypt, uh, they had a different understanding. Uh, of their relationship with God. God had specific expectations for them. Uh, they were in the infancy of their journey with God, and God had over 600 rules for how to, uh, how to be faithful, uh, 10 pretty clear ones. Um, and the people were stiff-necked people, and when they were in the wilderness, um, they didn't really abide all that faithfully. They even longed for uh, at least what they knew in the, in, in the confines of slavery. Um, <laughs> And God uh, was merciful, but God was pretty clear uh, and said to that first generation, you won't see the promised land. Um, you, you will live in the wilderness and you will die in the wilderness. But my promise to your people will remain. Uh, and your children, your children 
will inherit uh, this kingdom, uh, this, this promised land. Uh, and in fact, God was faithful to that promise. And the part where we are right there in the story is right at that moment, right before uh, they're getting ready to enter into the promised land. Uh, the Deuteronomy has gone through the retelling uh, of, of the story, the retelling of the giving of the law, uh, really preparing these people to understand what it is, the responsibility that comes uh, with, with walking into this new place promised by God. Uh, and um, what's taken place uh, right before the story that we hear uh, is that uh, the, these folks that have been born in the wilderness, uh, they're uncircumcised. They haven't been through that process of, uh, of covenant with God. And so, um, so God orders them all to be circumcised. Um, uh, Joshua is the guy who does the circumcising. Uh, and then right before they are getting ready to go into the, 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 the next is the story of the walls of Jericho, um, they have uh, a Passover and a remembrance, a sacred remembrance of that delivery out of slavery um, and uh, a reminder that it comes with responsibility. And that's how they kind of understood their relationship with God. We have to toe the line. Uh, and God will uh, be faithful to God's end of the deal. Uh, and in fact, uh, we see over the next centuries that, uh, uh, that they had a tough time towing the line. And the prophets kept telling them, you're missing the boat. You need to recalibrate. Uh, and so much so that they were uh, exiled from their land. Uh, and they saw it as, as, as punishment for their lack of fidelity um, uh, to the covenant. And so even at, and there's other covenants that came, but they still were so, somewhat molded by this understanding um, that if they were faithful, God would take care of them. Uh, and it becomes even more than that. If I'm faithful, maybe God will love me. Uh, and it becomes somewhat of a dangerous uh, relationship. Um, understandable how it got that way, uh, but that is the understanding uh, that is somewhat deeply imbued in the people who are asking Jesus these questions. Um, if I'm faithful, if I follow all the laws, if I'm a good and faithful person, uh, God will take care of me. And so when they see Jesus eating with outcasts, uh, eating with people who uh, not just uh, missed a few of the, the, uh, the outlying laws, uh, but people who were extorting their own people for their own gain, uh, prostitutes, uh, people who showed such disregard for the law um, that there was no way no way that they should be at the dinner table with the living God. And I realize that the epistle that we have today uh, is a reminder uh, that God is recalibrated, that God is calling us uh, to faithfulness uh, because of the experience uh, of being one uh, with God, of being part of a new creation, that it isn't a conditional covenant. Uh, it's a response to an unconditional love and grace of God. And that's how we act. That's how uh, we fall into obedience, uh, out of a sense of, uh, of, of, of indebtedness, out of a sense of gratitude, uh, out of a sense of, of joy in all that God has done for us. Uh, and so that's the, the situation we find ourselves in. And folks have said that uh, Jesus uh, may, uh, one of the things that may have been the most culminating fact uh, in the fact that Jesus was arrested and killed uh, was the people he socialized with. Uh, social order was pretty important. Uh, it was important to, to Rome, that, uh, uh, and they respected the fact that the, 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 uh, the, the people of Israel um, kept things in order. Uh, they weren't a problem for the Romans, um, and, uh, and the order was pretty important to the Jewish people as well. Uh, they understood their system, and Jesus was turning it upside down. Um, and so they asked Jesus, um, if you're the Son of God, if you know so much about God, why are you eating with people who clearly uh, aren't faithful? And he tells them three escalating parables. Uh, we missed the first two because we cut out uh, just to make time. It's already a long story. Uh, so he tells the first one, which is the story of the lost sheep. Uh, and we see the image of Jesus carrying the sheep in most stained glass uh, uh, churches with stained glass windows. Um, and he leaves, he foolishly, like no shepherd would, leaves the 99 and goes after the one. And the story is clearly about God's investment in the one. And then the next story uh, is the story of the woman, which is interesting and provocative. The woman, uh, the woman figure is the God figure in the story, um, who uh, searches for a coin that's so invaluable that they often stitched it into wedding garments. Um, and she looks everywhere, turns the house upside down for this one coin. And when she finds the coin, she throws a party that costs so much more uh, than that one coin. It seems fairly absurd. Uh, and we get from that 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 one coin matters. 
Uh, if we ever feel like a worthless coin, uh, we know we matter to God. And then the third takes us in the same direction, except it personalizes it and it adds so many layers in what's called the gospel inside the gospel, uh, the story of the prodigal. Um, and most of us think the story is exclusively about the prodigal. In fact, when I tell it in the children's uh, um, uh, book, the children's Bible in preschool, it doesn't even uh, mention uh, the other brother or how the money was gained. But uh, the story starts with the younger brother, who, who really is in kind of a tough situation, being the youngest. Um, you don't get the birthright. You get one third of, uh, of the inheritance if it is only one sibling. Uh, the, the, uh, the older gets two thirds. Um, and so you kind of probably always feel less than, uh, and especially when the older brother's doing all the work and, and seems to be um, the, the one who's going to get all of the reward. So I imagine it was kind of difficult. And he said, after a while, I'm done. I'm done being second fiddle. I'm done uh, being under my, my, my dad's thumb. I want freedom. And so he said to his dad, and this is heartbreaking, and then imagine this in the shame culture of the first century in a different part of the world. Can we pretend that you're dead? Can we live as if you don't? Can I get what I will get? It's not really mine. And let's think about what that means and how we might extrapolate that. Uh, let's give me something I did nothing to deserve. Um, one third of, my, uh, of your estate, one, my inheritance, let's give it to me now uh, while you're still living and pretend that you're dead. Imagine what that did to that father. Just imagine. And so he takes, uh, for some reason, the father uh, does acquiesce, uh, somehow uh, liquidates a third of his assets. Uh, uh, in, in the first century, I can't imagine how that took place, but gives it to him. He takes it uh, and he goes out um, and he spends it all on wild living. Quickly spends it all. Uh, so much so uh, that he is penniless and his only uh, means of survival is uh, working for a pig farmer, being a pig farmer. Uh, and think of that, and that is meant to be a visual affront uh, uh, the, to Judaism. Uh, that is how far astray he's gone uh, that, uh, that he's a pig farmer. Uh, it would be an absolute abomination uh, for a, a, a faithful Jew to be a pig farmer. Uh, and that's how far he's fallen. Uh, and he's thinking to himself, and he's not a particularly contrite person. He's not thinking, I cannot believe I did that to my father. I can't imagine the shame that he must be. And I can't imagine how he probably can't even look his neighbors in the eye uh, or how much uh, burden I've left on my older brother to take care of everything. Or I wonder if he's okay. All oh, he says is, I am so desperate. I am so absolutely desperate that the slaves that work on my dad's farm have a much higher quality of life than me, and maybe I can at least go and grovel enough to be treated like a slave. It's not an act of, uh, of remorse or contrition. It's an act of desperation. But he does. He starts walking back, um, and he's got his whole script ready to go. And he's walking back, um, and we learn something from the next line. While he was still far away, his dad sees which means something. It means that his dad probably started every single day and about every single hour looking down across the horizon at the end of that road, hoping one day that he would see his youngest child come back that road. It also might have meant that he wanted to stave off the neighbor who had every legal right to stone him to death for the embarrassment and shame he caused his, his father. Um, but whether it was to protect him or just because uh, he couldn't think of any other way to respond it said that he had compassion, which means that his loins uh, were up in his chest, that he felt the uh, visceral uh, chest pain as he hopped up, uh, and he ran like a sp sprinter, uh, as embarrassing and shameful as that would be for a father, uh, to run uh, like a sprinter to his son. And he throws his arm around him, and he kisses him, uh, and he holds him tight, uh, and as the, 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 the son's trying to get all the words of that script that he practiced so carefully out, He's just uh, beside himself. He says, get him a tunic, get him a ring, a uh, kill the fatty calf. We have to celebrate. My son who is dead is alive. That's the only thing he can think about. And so they do, and they celebrate. And that should be the culmination of that story. It went from the sheep to the coin to the actual being the child. The Pharisees aren't thick people. They would have understood exactly what Sometimes we think that it's sort of uh, the Pharisees are trying to dig at Jesus, and then he's trying to dig back at them. 
Uh, but there's so much more to the story. The next part, which I hope the Pharisees heard. You know, I, when I was in high school, um, Brad Pitt was sort of the big thing. And uh, it seemed like every uh, girl that I might have been interested in was far more interested in Brad Pitt. Um, <laughs> So whenever we go to the movies and see a, this is a little aside, you don't have to put a box around this. Um, <laughs> we go see a Brad Pitt movie, and uh, I was predispositioned to not really like the Brad Pitt character. Um, and they all were somewhat similar in that they made him out to be, not only did he look like uh, a, um, a, a, a god, but they actually you know, embellished his character, whether it was, uh, they were fairly similar. Montana in the World War I era, uh, whether it was A River Runs Through It or uh, Legends of the Fall, it was a similar character. But I do remember Legends of the Fall. I'm going to the movies um, and being like, oh, great. I'm going to see a Brad Pitt film. Uh, and then I'm going to try to you know, be as handsome and funny and, and whatever as I can be on the way home and hope uh, uh, that somehow she forgets about the, uh, the person on the screen. Um, but I do remember, it, and in, 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 in sure fashion, Brad Pitt played about as a, a, as attractive a character as he could, and all the women lusted over him. Um, but I really liked Aiden Quinn's character. I liked him as an actor, and I thought, um, this is the guy I'm rooting for. This is the brother I want to see win. Um, and he was such a great character at the beginning. He was so likable, uh, and he was the responsible, sturdy one. You know, the kind of thing every woman wants, the sturdy, reliable one. Um, and I watched as the movie started to take place, um, and I saw as the resentment started to build, uh, and as it started to build, as he started to see uh, being the responsible one as a burden, as he started to resent all of the affection uh, that was uh, allotted on, on Brad Pitt's character, it became like a poison. And he became less and less, uh, less and less likable. Uh, and he became more toxic. Uh, and of course, Brad's character became, uh, as much as he kept screwing up, uh, he, he became more heroic in the course of watching the movie. And I realized uh, how damning that burden and resentment can be when we carry it too heavily. Uh, and I think that's what happened to the older brother. But pay attention to the older brother. What did he do to deserve all of this that will eventually become his? He was born into it. I mean, he took care of it. Uh, but he started to see it as a burden. He started to see all that time that he had with his father that the other, uh, other son uh, didn't uh, as, as obligation. He started to see all the work uh, that went into taking care of, his, his, uh, of, of, of the lands that he was going to be given um, as a slavery, as, as, as something he was bound to. Uh, instead of uh, the response uh, uh, to a, a gift that would be generously and lovingly given to him, he started taking all of that for granted. None of it seemed like grace or gift anymore. And so when his brother came back, all he had was that toxic resentment. And he couldn't celebrate. He couldn't get to that place uh, where those two brothers met, a place of joy that God asks all of us uh, to find ourselves. And so as faithful as he was, as loyal as he was to the law, as faithful as he was, it was all burden. It was all weight. Jesus lovingly says to the Pharisees and the scribes, that's not what God intended. You are a great, great son. You've done everything I've asked of you. God loves you. God wants you to realize that he has treasured every moment. You may not have always felt that way. You may not have had the party that the one who came back had. But God loves you. And God invites you to find that place that place where your joy meets God's love and God's grace for you. And set your camp there, because that's what God invites all of us to, to find that place. Amen.